So welcome whenever and wherever you're watching this. My name is Gareth Evans. It's a real pleasure to be in conversation with the remarkable writer, artist, creator, collaborator across numerous media, Stephen Fowler. I'll welcome Stephen uh, properly in a minute, but I'd just like to thank uh, Milo and everyone at Resonance FM for uh, being able to film and be in conversation with Steve in this incredible space, which hopefully you will see a little later uh, into uh, the conversation. It's a, a, a chapel off ground level uh, on Borough Road in London, and we're delighted to be here because, of course, a chapel is a form of uh, civilization, should we say, a form of uh, collective purpose made manifest in architecture, which I think is very much one of the themes of the extraordinary novel, prose text, we're about to uh, speak to with and around. I'd also, of course, like to thank Dominic and everyone at Tenement Press for making this book possible, and this conversation, of course, available to you all wherever you are. Therese Henningsen, the wonderful artist filmmaker, is uh, recording for us now. Um, and so thank you, of course, finally, for uh, being with us for this conversation. Now, we are talking about this incredible book, Mueil, by S.J. Fowler, now, you'll notice the distinctive yellow jacket, uh, uh, which is, of course, the cover for all of Tenement Press's titles, um, with a photograph in the bottom right-hand corner, which makes them incredibly distinctive on bookshop and gallery shop tables. Now, you'll be, of course, familiar, perhaps, with other single-coloured uh, collections. I won't name any other publisher names. We respect them, of course, all of them. But yellow really is the uh, colour of choice today for us. And we think, of course, uh, with yellow, of the yellow jersey, which is what you get given when you win the Tour de France. Now, this is a tour de force, this publication. So there's a direct link there between the colour and the language used. And this is a book all about language. Now, Steve, this is an incredible book. Um, it really is a very striking distillation of many of your concerns that have been expressed in other linguistic forms uh, across uh, a decade or so of unbelievably productive output. But here, you really have delivered a novel. I mean, it's a readable novel, it's a novel in the conventional form, while also being a radical prose intervention into the crucial theme that you're investigating, which is all aspects of the museum, what it stands for, what it means in civilizational terms, what's it, what it means in labour terms for those people working in it, often very precariously, but also what it means culturally and why we actually even make museums in the first place, what they mean at this time in our culture when everything around us is collapsing when the whole idea of the past and the future are threatened and our present is staggering in the uncertain. So before we get into more detail about your strategies, why the Mueum and why now? It's a book that's actually just stated over nearly a decade because I was working at the British Museum as a guard for seven years and actually at the museum while working there on the galleries is where I started to write at all. So before I got the job working as a guard at the museum and I was hired as um, a late night uh, invigilator because of the First Emperor exhibition. So having no poetry or literature in my life at all and discovering at the moment that I was working within that space, which was you know, Chinese government backed <coughs> open till midnight, 15 quid a ticket, raised up on plinths in the reading room, I actually discovered you know, any poetry at all. I really didn't read poetry mm -hmm. before. In fact, I had huge amounts of contempt for it. Maybe at the moment I'm having a bit of a circle back on that, but um, I realized that underneath me, not only obviously it was where Marx wrote Das Kapital, but Pound and Gissing, all these incredible authors, even relatively modern ones like Kutzer and people like that had been in that space. So there was like this strange fusion going on, this almost fate for me to get into poetry through pure accidents mm -hmm. and, and really being mindful of that at the time that I happened to work in a place that was surrounded by these ideas of history and culture and the culture of poetry. And so I started to write my first poetry collection and this novel almost at the same time. Um, and I left it. And that's kind of a whole other different discussion that I don't want to digress too much about. But I realized over time that I'd perceived fiction and academia as a way to save me from the difficulty of that job, which was mm -hmm. six days a week, wasn't super well paid, was slightly difficult. And I thought, you know what, if I publish a novel, or I get a job teaching in a university, I'll be able to escape this. And I think that's the path for a lot of young artists and poets and so forth. And over time, when I started to meet novelists and I started to look at that industry, I realized I really didn't want to do it. And mm -hmm. we could talk about that perhaps <laughs> afterwards because there were some experiences I had that made me realize why. So <coughs> essentially, to cut a long story short, that initial burst of fiction writing, which I decided to leave behind, recently, uh, during the lockdown, came back to me. Mm -hmm. 
and I started to build upon it and I started to change it and bring it into what I now really perceive as a novella, something shorter, mm. something briefer, something more of a burst, very much not a novel. And an excerpt of it I'd submit to the White Review Prize and it got nominated for that prize in, I think, 2014. So there was some interest around it, but then bursting through it in lockdown and going back over a text that was very old to me, I realized it had the potential to become something new to me and something interesting. And then perhaps speak to a certain moment um, around museums, I suppose, but only once I'd had the distance of not working in the British Museum, because my experience of the British Museum wasn't a critical one necessarily about culture. It was about the fact that 22,000 people a day would go into an 18th century building Mm -hmm. and come up to me and say, where's the toilet? Is this all you do? And speak to me like I was a piece of shit, basically. And so when people walk into the British Museum and they imagine that it's a space of hallowed culture, actually I experienced it as a kind of frantic, painful, um, intensive experience of people's horrific rudeness. Mm -hmm. And so the book actually speaks to that as much as it speaks to the idea of cultural institutions. No, it very much does. I mean, we're very aware, you know, of precarious labour throughout with Greg, Rebecca and the narrator and and the kind of, you know, the the physical and psychological stampede of visitors, you know, across both, you know, millennia of culture and the staff, as you vividly described. I mean, thinking of, um, you know, other recent cultural artefacts around the idea of the collection, the museum, and I guess, you know, the gallery as a museum of art, it's interesting to place Mueyam in that kind of tradition because I'm thinking now of... Chloe Ridges' novel of the National Gallery, she worked there as a, an invigilator, a novel of Sunder. Jem Cohen's film Museum Hours, Jia Zhangke, the Chinese filmmaker's uh, remarkable film about the world, which is a theme park with buildings from across the world at miniature scale. Um, there's, there's an honourable lineage, but very few bring together um, all the elements that you do here, I think. And you're right to say, of course, novella, novel, I mean these are terms that are constantly debated, but I guess what I, what I would call it perhaps for the purposes of the remaining part of the conversation is narrative fiction, it's a page turner Sure. you know, at the end of a chapter we want to read on um, as to what's going to happen next, but going back to my point just earlier, this idea of, of Mueyam as a, as, as a really distilled, intense and incisive museum if you like, of its own of all the concerns that such buildings, cultural histories and intentions kind of suggest. So that's what struck me on first reading very, very strongly. Um, Now, thinking about your experience in the museum, in the British Museum, and of course in that very distinctive show, you left that, as you said, and went on to other things. But when you left it, did you stay in contact with other people? Was it a space where there was a a kind of resilient, um, almost like resistance-like mentality among the invigilators, or were they atomised and and precarious and just themselves, you know, on a road to somewhere else? Well, I don't want to get uh, too deep into like the personal experiences of working there, but I have to say it was an incredibly formative thing to be in the last generation of people there who were probably contracted, and I got to know an enormous amount of like strong union members and, inc- and incredible cast of characters, not only the visitors, but also the people working there. I mean, the history of people who did my job at the British Museum goes, it was all primarily ex-military. <coughs> Like a lot of the veterans of Rourke's Drift were the guards there. So it had this military vocabulary and parlance. And it had this completely unique subculture of essentially people employed to display space. They weren't, obviously they stopped people touching and give advice and stuff. But really there was this salty working class resistance Mm. meeting this, you know, semi-hipster young art people coming in. And those people actually, one of my colleagues at the museum showed me what sound poetry was, which is a huge part of my work now. Another was a visual artist, another was Mm -hmm, a composer. mm -hmm. And for me, it was like a school. And I needed that because at 24, I genuinely hadn't written anything. And so to experience that with these collaborators and friends and connections, a lot of them are still my best friends. And a lot of my relationships came from that. And in fact, I have reflected a lot, and it's kind of in the book, in my transition from a job that was essentially working class, although it had a lot of middle class people, including myself, in it, to the job I have now, uh, teaching at university, Mm -hmm. which is completely middle class, the camaraderie and the atomization for the latter yeah, yeah, is so yeah. remarkably different than the one yeah. where you share moaning with people all day long. And I think that was the lens by which then the themes of the novella became so important to me is remembering that in turning it into a novella recently, which is, you know, the excess, the intense excess, how excess chips away at reality. So people genuinely would come up to me in the museum and say, is this real? You know, is any of this real? As though to have a million objects is to mean that none of them could be real. Mm -hmm. And then leading into that, then, what is the real within that context? And resisting theory, you know, I'm a big anti-theory, anti-intellectual, anti-academic person. 
but I suppose touching on some of those theoretical ideas, how is truth and history yeah. revealed and given relatively and not judging it, not just being obviously boringly critical where people are like, you know, this is bad, this is a bad thing, because it's very easy for them to do that, having no responsibility for presenting cultural history. I was just interested in how incredibly relative the labeling, the signing, the narrative is. Even if it's morally positive, it's so relative and it's so finite. And so people walk into a museum and the objects are completely secondary. They are truly secondary. The, the label is read way before the object is experienced for the majority of people. It's free, so people go with a SLR lens and take pictures. Obviously not everyone, but the majority of it what was this experience of sub-reality. I'm standing there all day looking at objects that are 4,000 years old and watching people have to touch them to know somehow through tactility that they're real. So all that coming together and then look back at it, my colleagues, that sense of excess and stress and pain, we used to call it werewolfing. Someone would come up to you and go, is this all you do? And then they'd walk off and you'd be left with this, 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 this you know, reduction of yourself. Um, all of that kind of came together in the rewriting of it into a novella a year or two ago and, and that's kind of what I think it speaks to now. And I also did want to make it readable to jump back to that point. Mm. Because I think that Sometimes people are experimental or avant-garde or innovative for the sake of it and they become another kind of stereotype. You know, obviously everyone knows that my work kind of stands against the kind of normative, mm. mainstream, corporate, easily consumed idea because life is complex and work should be as mm -hmm. complex as life, if not more. But with this, so much of what I think poetry is supposed to be invites that experiment with language and performance and improvisation and sound poetry. So in the novella, it being my first, I wanted to make it mm. somehow readable because it would have been experimented for the sake of it. And there are, of course, chapters in it which are purely invented language, and ex Absolutely. experimentation is always relative. So thank you for noticing that, at least. No, no, completely. I mean, you know, it's, it's extremely readable. It's very funny as well. And, um, you know, that, that idea of humour is really central, I think, um, in, and important. One thinks of a, an artist filmmaker like John Smith, who came out of the structuralist film movement in the 70s, very dry, very obscurantist. You know, you were, were transgressive if you broke a, you know, a handful of ludicrous rules. And, you know, he's a naturally very funny person. He found expression for that in all, you know, films that are also remarkable artistic work. So, you know, there, there is that crucial importance. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit um, now about some of the, um, the literary kind of reference or, you know, um, tributaries, shall we say, feeding into your sense of, of the language in the book. Because... Um, the tremendous endorsements um, that the book has received, you know, speak to a certain European tradition, they speak to um, the fouling of the nest tradition that we find in German literature, Gomberitz and so on. Um, could you speak to, um, speak to those references? I wouldn't call them inspirations, it seems too sort of binary, but, but what was the language landscape that you were thinking of as this came, to, came together? Well, without waffling, discovering all poetry and literature at the same time and having no one having never studied it and, and still to this yeah. day haven't studied it, not knowing what is considered high or low <coughs> or middle right. and not really understanding sensibilities in the way that they're described, I felt a natural inclination towards the fiction of um, 20th century European letters or whatever people would say. And I was going, I then signed up to a master's a few years later at philosophy at Birkbeck and I was scanning massive novels, Robert Musil's Man Without Qualities, yeah. Andre Bilay's Petersburg, oh. And I was folding them like a hundred sheets at a time in, and putting them in my bum pocket, which had the British Museum over my ass cheek. And I'd pull them out in the gallery and like highlight bits of Musil. I've got a document with hundreds of lines from Robert Musil. And, and I thought that was kind of normal. I had no sense that that might be an unusual way to go about it. And then when later on I started to do events and share conversations with people, and people would be like, oh, it's translated. I'd be like, well, I don't understand that. Isn't that a thought exercise? It's not translated. It's English. Look, you can read it there. <laughs> and, and so that stuck with me for better or worse. So I thought it was relatively normal for people to go deep into, I don't know, Vickievich or Gombrowicz or Bruno Schultz or all these people. I thought they were fundamental, that you should have read all these, whoever, you know, these massive figures from European nations. But I realized in retrospect, it was not only that the sensibility was attracting me, the sense of complexity, mm -hmm. the sense of reflection on what the world's actually like, but also some of my colleagues. So I had a colleague who, who was Polish, mm -hmm. who you know, was working class Polish, who would, who would t teach me how to pronounce the names of Kwasowski or even I was saying, I remember saying Gide and he's like, it's Gide, mm. you know, like really giving me these things. Yeah, and I realized yeah. in retrospect, a lot of that was from people's kind of gifting mm. 
from their tradition because the yeah. staff at the museum were from Italy, from yeah. Poland, from France, from all over Europe. And it's just stuck with me so much that that tradition, which has a very strange place in the UK and has a very strange place with UK readers, it really is a, not only a marginal thing but a patronised thing. And then starting to go to festivals in Europe and you know, some of my books selling far more in Austria than right. it does in England. It's just something that's coalesced because of so many different things. And, and the reference points here, Gombrowicz and Thomas Bernhard, are, are just people whose satire and whose humour is so black, mm -hmm. is so naturally reflective on the kind of idiocy and strangeness of the world. And it is something, although I don't read enough contemporary British fiction to be able to comment on it, that is relatively absent here. Yeah. So I'm kind of proud if people have that reference point and say, oh, that book, or even my poetry, I get it a lot more. Mm. People be like, oh, this reads more like German poetry from the 80s or something. That's a huge compliment to me because most people look towards America and I don't. No, and tremendously um, uh, clear and also very glad that you don't in that way uh, at all because, you know, it, it's, it's really important what you said about, you know, working with, you know, people from across Europe. Um, for whom these writers, absolutely marginalised here and stuck into the, you know, the, the tiny experimental shelf at the back of the shop, are central to those literatures for sure. in a way that very limited writing is central to our culture most of the time. Well, there's huge ironies yeah. with someone like, I know, Eric Fried, yeah. who lived here right. for 40 years, and there's a, the massive national prize in Austria is the Eric Fried Prize. And if you go to his grave in Kensal Green Cemetery, you know, nobody knows who he is, yeah. and he lived here. So then not only are we ignoring the titanic figures beyond the, say, 50s and 60s where people know them, although they don't really read them. Yeah. You know, you ask someone about Brecht's poetry, they really haven't read it. Of course, it. yeah. But, I mean, people beyond that who actually lived here, corresponded with people here, were part of influencing a generation of English novelists. They are really ignored, and it's no longer voguish for people to read European poetry as a way of showing off. And that's a shame, because <laughs> no, really. they should. It's worth it. <laughs> no, it really isn't. Absolutely right. Um, it's interesting, you know, talking about the American... Um, the kind of uh, uh, divide, shall we say, the kind of cross the water that doesn't uh, inform you in any significant way. At the same time, I was thinking of the writer George Sanders, who's now hugely successful. He won the Booker Prize for Lincoln in the Bardo, which is a polyphonic novel about um, the limbo state between life and death primarily. But his satirical stories are really um, close cousins, I would say, to Muayam, because he's sharply satirical, he's very humane, very warm, um, but equally brilliant, um, as Muayam is, on, on the strange surrealism of precarious labour in, in structures beyond people's real understanding. So George Sanders is an interesting reference point, I think, although I completely appreciate it was not um, on your shelf when you were writing this. What is striking in this, and there's, a, again, a direct link with Sanders in the spirit of the writing, is, as I mentioned, the humour. And there's a great line, just one of many, where... Um, the narrator is looking at their lanyard and realises that the lanyard is updated every few years, but the picture never is, to remind, um, to remind the narrator, or so the narrator thinks, of the kind of need and sort of youthful despair and urgency of the first employment period, which is a tremendous moment. Based on truth as well. Right. But as you said yourself at the beginning, you know, this, this book uh, took many years to, to write and uh, came, came and went, came and went and so on. So, so what do you think of it now as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a durational project? I mean, it's, it's both a project in place, of course, the experience of the museum, um, but it's also a project in time because of how, how uh, long it took to kind of gestate. What does it do for you in your larger project of, of, of writing, the fact that it currently, as of right now today, um, is both the beginning and the culmination of your creative practice to date? Yeah, I think going back to it exactly 10 years after I started to read and write, mm -hmm during the lockdown when I had the time to do that, I realised quite a few things ar around it. First and foremost, <coughs> that I needed to not want to write fiction to write fiction. I needed to not want to be a fiction writer because it comes with a certain thing. It comes with a certain kind of, it has a perception of some sort of upgrade mm -hmm. from the experimental performer or the experimental filmmaker or yeah. something. Yeah, the, yeah. the novelist is something like a famous musician will dip into. I'll just pop out a few novels. And over the years, that started to corrode my opinion of what it was. So I needed to not want to do it to do it. And then I needed the right people to be with me on the journey. Mm -hmm. Dominic Jacob and Tenement, I needed, I needed his help mm. because I needed to be able to build it into something that I thought would fit within I'm so obsessed with methodology, why so many poets, especially in the UK, never choose their method, they just choose their subject. Mm. I'm going to write a book about carpets, oh, it's just going to be free verse or sonnets, it's not going to be visual, it's not going to be sonic, it's not going to be collaborative, it's yeah. not going to be a samic, 
And so to think hard about the method of fiction as something outside of what fiction is as a culture, mm. I needed someone to help me publish it and develop it and edit it. And I also needed that moment to look back over 10 years and think, no, this fits within what I want to do because without being too grand or going too deep, I have a constant interrogation of why I am doing what I am doing. Mm. It, it's a waste of time in many ways. So why is it that I'm doing it? I need to feel strongly that there's some instinct within me that feels like it's worthwhile for me. And that's selfish. That I don't care what anyone thinks about any of the works that I've done. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to maintain what I've done for so long and so much of it. Yeah. And I'd be fascinated to ask you about the same thing. How do you stay motivated? And this just fit at the right time in the right moment. But now I realize it's coming out. I have no desire to write more fiction. <laughs> Maybe it'll come. But mm -hmm. the circumstances had to coalesce without uh, nostalgia but with a moment during the lockdown of 10 years and thinking, I need to pick that up again. This is the yeah. right time for it. So I'm very grateful for Dominic for helping me do that because if he didn't, I would not be shipping it around to agents. I would not be doing all that stuff. Yeah. I just, I don't know why my heart has bottomed out with the way that that's gone, the corporate nature of fiction and, and the way I've, I've noticed a lot of, I've got, had this opportunity to go to festivals where I'm the least famous person <laughs> you know, big festivals abroad and I sit there and I've been around the table with novelists and I've seen what it does to sit indoors all day writing. I've seen what it does to spend your life inside of a room. And maybe one day if I break my leg, that's what I'll be doing. But for now, I want to be out making things, collaborating, mm. curating, that's in my heart. And this is a little burst through that might give me new paths. And so I really owe it to Dominic and everyone who supported the book to allow me that. Well, it is, of course, absolutely a collaboration, you know, with a great press, and, and Dominic is a great close editor. I mean, it sits very well within the, uh, the burgeoning list at Tenement, because, of course, it's a multidisciplinary list. It has poetry, it has hybrid works, it has the essay, um, many more distinctive works to come. And so it's a great location, because, of course, it is a novella, it is a, 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 a piece of narrative fiction, but it's also, you know, much else besides. And I'm very struck by what you said about the formal um, structuring of, of a thematic, let's say, carpets, as you, you know, what, what might, what form might it take? Because, you know, you, you are very articulate, as you would expect, about your own rigorous process of making. And uh, the books that I've seen of yours, and I've only seen a fraction of the more than 50 produced now, always have some kind of structuring device within them, which you then, of course, frequently rupture because structures are made to be challenged. So in terms of, of thinking about this as, as a book, there are um, several structural interventions into what is broadly an unfolding narrative. Yeah. One around an invented language, one around a very strange bodily encounter, and it's bookended by forms of collapse. I'm not gonna say more than that because you know, we don't wanna spoil the reading experience. But how did that, um, that internal structuring develop, and the, particularly the, around the idea of those interventions? Yeah, I think looking at teaching, uh, uh, at Kingston University and having to teach short fiction and novellas and novels and not really writing them really gave me a you know, hypersensitivity to how methodology and structure might operate within fiction away from what I've done in poetry, which is really try to push what poetry collection can be, mm. a choose your own adventure, a visual in with text, you know, all these different things that I've done that you kindly referenced. So I started to think very carefully, what's the bleeding line between bursts of prose poetry, between what is chaptering, what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. How does one evoke a novella rather than a novel or a short story or a prose fiction or anything like that? So what I wanted to do is couch the hyper-experimental or extremely experimental chapters or the, the, the strange references with these poetic prose poems, the beginning and the end, which really, honestly, I'm really so into Warhammer. <laughs> Warhammer 40,000. Uh, <laughs> no, I know it will. I love Warhammer so much, and I read Warhammer almost every day. And so, and also sci-fi, I teach it so much because most master students want to write YA or sci-fi or fantasy. And so I've got really in deep into sci-fi, but also my tradition is experimental literary. So how do I fuse these interests in weird apocalypses along with a reflection on banal working? Well, I, I felt like it had to be light heavy, light heavy, light heavy. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit less methodologically rigorous than I would make a poetry collection because I wanted it to be readable. Mm -hmm. I wanted, and I have had friends who have read it so far have said, oh, actually, yeah. I could read this, yeah, yeah, yeah. which made me obviously very pleased. So yeah, I thought of it in that way. How do I actually make it open for people to flow through the more text dense bits? It's interesting you say Warhammer, I mean, because um, obviously a number of our viewers might not know um, exactly what Warhammer is, which is a tabletop uh, model-making apocalypse game in which huge armies um, 
of uh, extraordinary violence um, try and destroy each other across millennia. It's, true. Um, it's one of the biggest games of its kind in the world now, huge success. It's a billion, yeah, billion quid. Company. Right, absolutely, and it, and it all comes out of the Midlands. Um, it's a small company that still, I think, is wholly Nottingham. family owned. Yeah. You know, it's a very interesting uh, English success story. Not many of those, of course, in the current economic crisis. Um, but it's no, it's a, it's a it's a kind of visionary landscape with endless um, spilling, accompanying volumes, backstories, histories, and so Huge on. Huge amount of books. Right, I love it. Now that now, now that gives me a new insight into your own body of work because it is also extraordinary, the spilling, fecund, hybrid, cross disciplinary, cross pollinating, etc as you are collaboratively with other individual makers and also structurally with all the festivals um, and projects that you're underway with both nationally and internationally. So where does that um, inevitable, um, uh, almost physical, visceral need to create, collaborate and make come from? Have you identified that in yourself at any point? Um, yeah, I think about it every year because I think about changing my job and I think about how constantly, I'm going through it right now, I haven't just finished my fifth festival, my European Poetry Festival, and I'm going through a moment where I'm thinking, should I change job and go back to teaching martial arts, which I did before, mm. or working more practical jobs? I don't know the answer. I, I think that it's better than most jobs. <laughs> it's better than most existences. I'm mostly really content and mostly quite healthy and mostly a better person than I was previously. And that sounds super glib and a little bit uh, twatty, but that's how I feel, you know, if I keep writing poetry, working with publishers, collaborating, generating friendships around people who I've met with in this world, they're mostly lovely, mostly supportive. I find it very easy, stress-free, and I think about it in those terms. I want to create works that are low and high, and I want to do all these things in certain moments where I'm like, oh, I'm going to try this, and I want to be in this tradition, but really, Deep down, the thing that really motivates me is that I want to be content and I want to live a life which is generous. And mm -hmm. that's why I don't really want to sit in for five weeks and write the great novel, but I want to go out and collaborate with people and meet people and be hospitable. I mean, not to say that I can't turn on people or be a, a dickhead, but that's why I keep doing it. I can't think of anything else I could do at this point mm -hmm. which would be better. And I'm just getting enough from the universe to tell me to keep going, just. And so it seems like a nice path, especially now that I think back to 10 years of it. Things like this come out. You have, I'm speaking to you, a dear old friend who supported my work for so long, and Dominic publishes it, and I feel like people respect it. Just to take it back full circle, my job before in the museum, which I did for seven years, was having people come up to me and go, the toilet's blocked, you need to stand outside of the toilet. And I'm so glad I did it. But now my life is so nice and juicy and easy. And that's why I keep writing books, because that's part of the flow, isn't it? Yeah. You've got to keep that going, you've got to keep the juices going, you've got to keep writing, making, generating things. Because so many of my dear friends who are more talented than me give up. And that's what I say to my students, and that's the answer to your generous question. How do I not give up doing this? Because it seems like a good thing to be doing with my life. I mean, that's a tremendous answer and, you know, informs, I think, you know, many of us who are, you know, often struggling in different ways with, you know, similar, um, you know, discursive uh, interrogations inside ourselves about the priorities and the possibilities, you know, the choices, the compromises and so on. I mean, I think what's very striking about your body of work across all forms, including, you know, um, the, the, you know the sheerly conversational, collaborative and companionable, shall we say, as well, which is vital, as you said, is that you're creating the conditions primarily in which your work can then be received. And it seems to me incredibly important that, actually, particularly when you know, anything that we would value culturally in this country is always, by definition, marginalised. You know, where we have a government who despises art and culture and is doing everything it can to undermine and, and uh, remove it. Similarly, we have corporatised universities that are entirely financialised. So even the kind of the future um, institutions, the, the theoretically future-facing institutions generating the cultures of, of the time to come are themselves utterly abandoned by... Um, anyone who cares, it seems, in management levels. So, you know, to create the conditions, of the landscape of one's own possibility, possibility and, and also productive um, output, shall we say, is, is fundamental. I'm very struck by that in all sorts of makers, but I think very few come close to the, to, the, to the scale of the kind of creative geography that you're making, along with many other people that you bring along for the journey. So that's very, very important, I think. Um, now, having written this novella, you've made it very clear that if another one appears, then it will appear out of a certain you know, con uh, configuration of, of scenarios in, in your own life, in time and place, and, and form and content. 
But where do you find yourself now, given what you just said, that broadly this is a good place to be at the moment? What do we see coming up in the, in the coming months uh, from Stephen Fowler? Yeah, well, there is something I've been thinking about a lot at the moment. I want to give air to Muiam, I really do, because it seems like a rarefied and special thing for a first piece of fiction to come out and also to see what people feel about that. <coughs> and also having done my festival and finished, you know, teaching cycles and stuff like that. Increasingly, I'm interested in to refer to exactly what you just said, which I couldn't agree more about. I think not only are we in a moment where those massive structures where we're supposed to be protected from the feeling of being mm. completely marginalized, but it's trickled down into the idea of even some people who use the word experimental or marginal are in fact interested in comforting and engaging with corporate streams. There's a, blend, a bleeding now where you're so kind and it really does lift me up a little bit to hear you say that it's positive that I create the space around some of my own reception. At times I find that very difficult because you can't help, I mean I'll point to other people, I put on 100, 200, 300 poets a year who are amazing and the vast, vast majority are absolutely marginalized and ignored in the most intensive way, almost like it's an active <laughs> desire for something that's supposed to be set up to appreciate people's authentic innovation and idiosyncratic expression of their existence. They are completely marginalized for biography mm. or for moralism at the moment. So there is times when I think, oh my God, stuff this, stuff this noise. If I was in a different space, there wouldn't be all these dialogues around justification. But because of that feeling, and it has grown a little bit in the last year because we're living in weird times, increasingly performance is the space where I don't feel it because you get immediate feedback. Mm. So I've been doing a series of purely improvised performances started a couple of years ago where I'll just get a time slot, half an hour, an hour, and go to a festival and just plan nothing and get up and improv and do talking poems like David Anton. Mm -hmm. And working with a lot of experimental musicians whose scene seems so different. So yeah. I don't think I'll ever let go of any of these things I've built, but my constant curiosity is a way of putting the wolf outside of the door and not giving up. So I think what's ahead of me, I hope, is stuff that I can't think of and can't predict more performance, mm. and then trying to create new spaces and collaborations and new ideas because people sustain you, right? Yeah. I mean, you must know that more than anyone, the amount of people you work with. You find a new wonderful collaborator, someone like Milo or someone like Dominic, and you start to work with them, and you actually do have the energy and impetus to do another thing, and that leads you to another thing. Mm. So my desire is to stay open to new ideas and, and, <coughs> and work increasingly in the live because the live, you get this moment where you're like, this isn't a waste of time where there's other moments where you, re you really yeah. feel that. And that's the battle, you know. No, I mean, well put. And, and it's crucial. People and spaces are fundamental. And it's interesting what you say about experimental music because just in London, of course, and there are many venues in other cities, we have Eclectic, 100 Years, Cafe Otto. They're real homes, of course, for experimental language as well, but particularly for experimental and, and free and improvisational music. And they feel like they've managed to make a space very important to have a space outside of your own tiny flat or whatever it For is, sure. right? an actual public space that you can meet in. You know, as we've said, with language being particularly threatened here when it, when it uh, pushes beyond the boundaries, you know, there isn't a space as such, so you've had to make a nomadic kind of space. Yeah, there isn't all. a space for poetry like that. I've always said that, why is there a Tate Modern, but there's no poetry space for innovative contemporary right, art. It's just so marginalised and it's, it's a real heartbreaker. And that's why I put on the festivals in many ways. Because yeah. I can put on 100 people and you go to their website and all they've got is the gigs that I've done and the videos I've shot of them. Absolutely. It's super motivating because you're like, oh no, this is important because if I wasn't doing this, no one else would. And that's how I feel when someone publishes my novella. It's not like there's a queue of people desperate to publish my books. So, you know, that is something we have to do for each other. But I think it's, you know, it's interesting given that, you know, we find that hostile landscape uh, for, for language. You know, what you've done with your kind of... Um, you know, your rolling thunder, your sort of, you know, Bob Dylan never-ending tour of venues is to, is to bring those spaces um, of, of this kind of creativity into established spaces that probably at the, before that you come through the door have no idea what you're about to do, whether it's a pub on the river at the, um, in the Thames, which, you know, I've been involved in an event that you've staged in such a location through to obviously, you know, organisations, structures, galleries, etc. Numerous, too many to name here, um, where suddenly language is seen in the same way as visual art, let's say, or experimental film, a space of creative possibility in that way, pushing the boundaries formally and thematically. And, you know, we could, you know, spend hours trying to work out why um, England, particularly, arguably much less so than, than America, is so scared of linguistic innovation, you know? Sure. It, it's the world language. Maybe it doesn't think it needs to do anything to interrogate itself, you know? Um, so there's that, perhaps. But, you know, by travelling constantly as you do, um, I think that's, that's a really important alternative way of not giving up and of actually making these spaces possible, temporary autonomous zones, you know, across the, the, the city, the country and the continent.
um, so that people can come across them where they weren't expecting to. That's, that's really vital. And definitely travelling is one of the things that's kept me going because when I go and do a weird talking sound poetry performance in Slovenia, they're like, this is really amazing, this is interesting. Yeah. And you go back to England and people are leaving, <laughs> then you're a bit like, oh, well, wait a minute, it's sensibility, it's not the work. Absolutely, and you find that sensibility by, by moving. It's also interesting to compare that finally as we, as we move to a close here um, with, the, with the stillness of the museum invigilator. Yes, you're moving between galleries over the course of a shift, but at any one point you're standing still and the world is, is spewing past you. Um, history is, you know, nominally all around you, but the, the very... Um, uh, vivid and un often unpleasant pre present tense of the mob is kind of stirring around you. Um, there's that idea that you know you stay in one place long enough, the whole world will come to you. At the same time, you can go out and find it. I, I like how you kind of bring those two together in your writing and, and in your being. But also, I think what's so interesting being here in the in the, the resonance chapel, um, a building with, of course, incredible resonance in every sense. Um, and understand that this was previously occupied at one point in its life by Art Angel. And one of Art Angel's most distinctive projects is a, a work made with Francis Alice, uh, the art, artist based in Mexico, in which he releases a fox into the National Gallery at night. And the fox, on its own, is travelling through the galleries and is observed by us, the viewer on the film, through the surveillance cameras. So we see a fox um, in, a, in a building dedicated to colour, um, by definition, from the uh, old masters onwards. Um, travelling through the gallery in its own way, in its own time and place, and, and determining the route of our, of our looking, because the cameras follow. It feels to me that you're, in many ways, that fox. You're the wild imagination coming into these hallowed institutional spaces of great um, monolithic um, stasia sometimes, I think, a kind of stasis of unknowing about what they're for, really, anymore. Um, from internally, and, and you kind of give us that wild way of wandering through these, through these spaces. So I'd urge you, if you if haven't seen it, to find uh, uh, Francis Alice's work on the Art Angel website, but before that, of course, go to tenantpress.com, find uh, all the details of how to um, acquire your own copy of Muayan by S.J. Fowler, and the many other titles forthcoming um, onwards throughout this year and beyond, of course, from Tenement Press. It's been a real pleasure to be in conversation with Steve. Many thanks to Therese, to Milo, everyone here at Resonance, to Dominic and Tenement Press likewise. But, of course, please, wherever you are and whenever you're watching this, uh, raise a glass and uh, put your hands together for the extraordinary creative force that is Stephen Fowler. Thanks so much, Stephen. I'm a fox. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth.